the topic for today is Luther and uh, Lutherans and worship. Um, I'll, just a little bit of review here. I'll uh, start out with, um, because this is part part two. So I'll, I'll spend a few minutes going over what we talked about before. Again, covering ground is always good. Recovering ground, I should say. Um, basic Lutheran theology and a basic th theology of worship from a Lutheran perspective. And then we'll go into a little bit of history, how Luther changed worship, how worship changed under pietism, and then changes that my own denomination, the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America has experienced in worship, and just hold that up as uh, something for you to consider um, as you, as we think together. Uh, now that I'll be uh, working with you, as we think together about worship um, in Indonesia. So that's the plan. So just a few minutes of review here from last time. Again, uh, here's our basic Lutheran theology, uh, uh, maybe boiled down just to the very, very kernel. Um, with the with the seal, but in one sense, um, you know, if we, we ask what it is to be Lutheran, Lutherans are identified by their common confession, and uh, most Lutherans in the LWF subscribe to, or they say they believe, what the Augsburg Confession teaches. Um, the uh, several of the churches in Indonesia also, I believe, uh, subscribe to the Augsburg Confession. But there's also this uh, confession of faith of the Hurya Christen Batak Protestant, um, which um, the LWF has said, yeah, that what the uh, the confession of uh, the uh, Batak confession contains uh, significantly and, and substantially just the same as the Augsburg Confession. So I just wanted to point out, I, I really appreciate what the Bata Confession, for example, says on scripture, because sometimes we, we struggle with that understanding. What does it mean when we say sola scriptura? We don't mean, we don't mean that it's, you know, all we need to do is read the Bible together, right? Because we do preach, right? And when we preach, we don't just say the words of the Bible. But um, I love it the way that uh, the Bata Confession puts this. According to this doctrine, we emphasize the Holy Scripture is completely sufficient to reveal God's being, being and God's will. And the Holy Scripture is also completely sufficient to instruct what to believe in order to have eternal life. So, um, most Lutherans don't, you know, in, in, in America, most Lutherans uh, aren't very familiar with the Augsburg Confession, and it may very well be that Lutherans in Indonesia um, members of your churches don't know too much about either the Augsburg Confession or the uh, Batak um, Confession. But there are these basic Lutheran ideas that kind of characterize Lutheran ways of being Christian. So first of all, we're centered on this claim that we're justified by grace alone, okay. through faith alone. Bahwa pembenaran oleh kasih karunia melalui iman di dalam Kristus. By the way, I'll, I'll just point out that we hope that we'll be having... Uh, seminars focusing on each one of these kind of basic Lutheran ideas uh, coming up in the next year or so. So uh, we believe we're justified by grace through faith in Christ. We have this uh, characteristic teaching about the word of God, that Jesus is the word of God in the primary sense. In a second sense, the word of God is gospel and law. And then the scriptures are the written word of God. We believe that uh, the word and sacraments are the means that we receive that grace by which we by which we believe in Christ. So we're justified by grace through faith. We receive faith by receiving the word and the sacraments. We have this theology of the cross that tells us that uh, discipleship is a matter of not a matter of uh, um, uh, of of um, you know uh, necessarily uh, having prosperity as the world counts prosperity but it means picking up the cross and following behind Jesus. We have a, a really uh, important way of talking about what it is to be a Christian, how we live out our Christian lives. Lutherans believe that, um, that everywhere that the church exists, discipleship will be somewhat different because the needs of the people will be somewhat different. So uh, discipleship is contextual. And then 
Finally, we believe that we are at the same time saints and sinners. So the saints remain sinners um, and the church is always reforming. So we'll be talking about each one of those in the time coming. But today we're talking about worship and um, Lutheran perspectives on worship. I think these shots are from uh, uh, the Lutheran church in uh, Palambong. I think it's at HKBP church. And uh, I, I really love this because, as I said before, it reminded me very much of worship when I was growing up. This is what worship looked like in the place that I grew up. But um, the worship service that I've uh, watched online several times from different churches very much was like the worship service that I grew up with. And so I felt right at home, although I don't I'm, I'm working on learning Bahasa Indonesia. Um, I could very much recognize the worship service. Here's a shot of worship. I, be I believe this is in Malaysia and I believe it's the uh, uh, Basel Christian Church of Malaysia. It could be the um, Protestant Christian Church of Malaysia, but the style is very different, right? Electric instruments, the youth are leading worship, everything's projected onto the screen. Um, I was in uh, Malaysia in Sabah for about three months in 2019. And every weekend I was out at a different church and it was almost all the churches. This is how they do their worship in the Basel Christian Church in Malaysia. It was really lovely to see. Here's worship in a very a different style, right? In, in Africa, this is a, a shot of worship in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Southern Africa. I think this must be the ordination of a bishop because um, we have all these bishops with their, with their uh, distinctive hats on. So, just uh, to note, uh, there are a lot of ways that worship may be different. And these are perfectly legitimate reasons for worship to be somewhat different from place to place. Different places and historical times, different cultures and languages, different musical styles. Some churches have lots and lots of ritual and some have pretty uh, simple and basic ritual. Some churches are very kind of formal in presentation and some speak very much in common language. Um, some have altar clothes and pyramids and the pastor wears uh, all sorts of robes and some the pastor just wears, you know, a clothes like you would wear on, on, on a regular work day. We have different expectations of exactly what the Holy Spirit will do when we gather in worship, right? Um, there are Lutheran churches where there's lots of speaking in tongues and other um, manifestations of, of uh, the Holy Spirit. But there are ways that the church is essentially one. So, you know, from Exodus 20, you know, God said to the people, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other God. So we have one, one God that we worship. Ephesians 4, there's one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is father of all. And then Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So other Bible verses, you know, um, as well. My favorite Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. So, um, there are a lot of ways that worship can be uh, the same, or the worship can be different from place to place, but uh, we are the same because one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Here's kind of the, the main point according to our kind of Lutheran way of looking at worship. And that is, we understand, first of all, that when we come to worship, if we ask what exactly is going on, we might think that worship is about us giving something to God, that we're going to give God praise or to give God offerings or something like that. But from a Lutheran perspective, no, the very first and most important thing to know about worship is that God acts, that God comes to us and that God gives to us in worship. So uh, God gives us in worship, God, uh, the, the primary thing is that God comes and gives us love through Christ, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, um, of course, we do sing and we praise and we make offerings and so forth. Very important response. But the first and most important thing is that worship is God's means to grace us through the means of grace, um, the word and the sacraments with God's love. 
So God always acts first and God acts first in the love of Christ Jesus. So just to repeat that, God calls us to worship first and foremost, not in order to receive anything from us, but in order to give us the word of grace in Christ. To give us the Holy Spirit through the word and through the Holy Spirit to give us faith and power to live in love, picking up the cross, following Jesus. So that's such an important point. We'll do it one more time. God calls us to worship first and foremost, not in order to receive anything from us, but in order to give us the word of grace of God in Christ. To give us the Holy Spirit through the word and through the Holy Spirit to give us the faith and power to live in love, picking up the cross and following Jesus. So pretty much everything else uh, from this point in the presentation or really from our Lutheran point of view on worship really comes from this idea. So let's talk a little bit about how Lutheran theology has shaped Lutheran worship. That idea about worship has shaped the way that we worship. And we'll start with uh, real quickly again, going through the reform of the mass. In the 1500s, Luther thought the mass was too complex for people to understand and that God was misrepresented as loving and ungracious in the mass and that the law was used to terrify people of divine punishment and, and some other ideas. Now, this is review, so I won't go through all of them. But remember the image that we have. Uh, this is a middle age, uh, an image from the Middle Ages of, uh, of uh, worship. You know, here we have uh, you know, the Christ in his glory. And everybody is terrified of Jesus in this image, right? This is from the, I believe, the 13th century in Germany. You can see the saints, you know, here's a king, here's a bishop with the hat, here's another one. They're all terrified of Jesus. Well, Luther said, well, there's something wrong with this image. And for Luther, the worship service is first and foremost to be a means for the people to hear the proclamation of Christ. Again, quoting Ephesians, to hear that by grace you have been saved through faith. And the faith even is a gift of God. We're not put right with God by works. So for Luther, the key question when it came to changing the worship service was what actions or words best proclaim Christ? Sometimes Lutherans like to kind of stick with the uh, Luther's German, the language that he spoke. So it's was Christum trept. So um, we have the Augsburg Confession, which again is the uh, original confession of the Lutheran churches that sort of tells what exactly it, is it to be Lutheran. And um, in one of the articles on worship, it, uh, it states as follows, falsely, our churches are accused of abolishing Holy Communion. For Holy Communion is retained among us and celebrated with highest reverence. And then here's the part I wanted to emphasize for now. Nearly all the usual ceremonies are also preserved, save that the parts sung in Latin are interspersed here and there with German hymns. So we'll, we'll make the PowerPoint presentation available to you all so you can look through the whole article. But um, just wanted to note, when Luther reformed the divine service, um, he kept an awful lot, but he cut out the parts that he thought made worship too complex. He put it in the language of the people. He added uh, hymns with familiar and German uh, music, German uh, familiar music and German uh, words. And he cut out the parts that he thought were contrary to the mass. So prayers to the saints, uh, he cut out any suggestion we're saved by worshiping in the right way or that worship's a good work. And he cut out anything suggested that the priest sacrifices Christ again at every mass. So we don't have to go through the exact form of the service, but I just wanted to point out um, as while well, Luther cut out a lot of parts of the mass, there was one part that he in a way put back in back in the Middle Ages uh, in Luther's day, it was uncommon for people to receive Holy Communion very regularly. In fact, many places, people just received communion four times a year around Christmas, around Easter, around Pentecost, and around Corpus Christi, I think was the name of the holiday. Um, or, uh, uh, but um, Luther said, well, that's, that's not how it looks like it was in biblical times. So 
In the Augsburg Confession, we read, we don't abolish Holy Communion, but we religiously maintain and defend it. For among us, Holy Communion is celebrated every Lord's Day and on other festivals in which the sacrament is offered. So, in summary, reforming and maintaining faithful worship according to the Lutheran tradition, um, some points, God's, pri God's primary pur purpose in worship is to share the love of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and thus the means for us to believe and live faithfully. And any ways that we change the worship or any ways that we keep worship the same, we should always be willing to ask, you know, what changes or what, uh, what ways of staying the same will best proclaim Christ? Um, local leaders and congregations uh, have typically had a lot of authority and freedom to try or not try new or old forms or practices. Luther himself wrote up two different worship services um, for his own place for Wittenberg. One was uh, in Latin, which was the language of kind of international students and so forth. And another was for the common people in German. And he said explicitly, well, this is what we do in Wittenberg. You in your own place, you might need to do something different. But when in doubt, Lutherans have also tended to keep or reclaim older forms of worship, trusting that the Holy Spirit has been at work in the church since the very beginning. So um, older, uh, you know, we, we tend to trust that older forms of worship are you know, probably have something really good about them, even if even if they no longer work for us very well. We kind of give uh, the benefit of the doubt to older forms of worship. So this is a, a woodcut or a painting that shows what worship looked like in Luther's day. And in Luther's day, it looked very much like um, Roman Catholic uh, worship. It, uh, in, in terms of outward appearance, there wasn't much difference. They kept candles. There's a crucifix. Um, you know, the sacraments were very central. So, central. so here's uh, an image of a child being baptized. Uh, people receiving Holy Communion. Very important change was uh, Luther insisted that uh, lay people should also receive the blood of Christ in the Middle Ages. You might remember they only re they were only allowed to receive the body of Christ. Um, actually, this figure here receiving the cup is uh, probably Martin Luther. Um, and of course, the sermon was very important. So just wanted to kind of show this is what it looked like uh, in Luther's day to worship in Wittenberg. Okay, so now let's talk about music in worship. This is uh, all new stuff now. We, um, we might usually think about Luther in this way, and it's not wrong to think about Luther this way. Here he is, uh, you know, saying we, we might suppose, here I stand, you know, uh, um, I, I, I'm teaching justification by grace through faith, and all of the church authorities are accusing him, or maybe this fellow here is putting his hand up to keep Luther away, who knows? But we might also think about Luther in this way. Um, here he is playing the lute, which was a kind of a forerunner to the guitar, singing with his family. So a family man, he loved music. Here's his friend, Philip Melanchthon, well, his close co-worker, Philip Melanchthon anyway, perhaps drinking a German beer there. So Luther loved music. A couple of quotations from Luther about music. Next to the word of God, Luther wrote, music deserves the highest praise. The gift of language combined with the gift of song was given to man that he should proclaim the word of God through music. Here's another one. A person who does not regard music as a marvelous creation of God must be a clodhopper, <laughs> a fool indeed, and does not deserve to be called a human being. He should be permitted to hear nothing but the braying of asses and the grunting of hogs. So Luther was very colorful and earthy sometimes, as you might know. Luther composed around 30 hymns. Not all of those. We, we don't still sing uh, all of those hymns. Some churches sing more than others. Um, but uh, here, are, uh, here are about 20 of them that, that are still sung pretty frequently in the United States anyway. But uh, he, he was a composer, he loved music and, and uh, he composed many hymns in the German language, the language of the people. So I saw an article online that said, the, the title was, How Martin Luther Became the First Christian Pop Star. Well, 
that might be going a little bit too far, but um, Luther is said to have composed hymns that were uh, to very familiar tunes or that were to tunes that sounded very German. So he said, just like we should worship in the language that the people could understand. Remember in the Middle Age, in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, the worship service was in... Dan oleh orang-orang umum, di dalam bahasa Jerman, tidak hanya di dalam bahasa Latin, yang tidak dimengerti oleh orang-orang ataupun rakyat. Mereka tidak berbicara bahasa Latin. Jadi dia ingin... But here's what we can say about Luther and, and worship. Music and worship was really important to Luther and to the first Lutherans. Luther was glad to change the style of music used in worship. He didn't insist on keeping the old kind of Latin and middle uh, medieval styles. But in making decisions about what to change and what to keep in the worship service and with regard to music, Luther asked, you know, was Christum tribe what? What changes will help people to receive Christ more powerfully? And which traditions should we keep in order to share Christ best? So I wanted to have just a few minutes to talk about Lutheran pietism. Lutheran pietism was a, a movement that began in the middle to late 1600s, I believe. So right after uh, Luther's day, um, there was a period that we called uh, that was called orthodoxy where um, really really smart people in the church worked really hard to write the, the confessions uh, you know we believe we we subscribe we subscribe to the augsburg confession but there were other confessions and there were lots of arguments in the church about um, about about the faith and luth and faith began to be focused very much just on having correct beliefs. Well, the pietists came along and they said, well, faith must be also about the heart, about uh, our, our feelings and our, and our uh, feeling of devotion to God. So some characteristics of Lutheran pietism. I should say, by the way, that, that um, uh, pietism was a really important movement, left a lot of really, really fantastic things going on in the church, still is a really important movement. And it's very complex. And so any kind of generalization like this is tricky. So uh, um, I'm, uh, th this is just kind of in a, in a very general sort of way. I think we can say all of these things about pietism. So pietism stresses the, imp the importance of personal inward experience of faith. So it's not that teachings weren't important, but very central was the sort of feeling of uh, of. Uh, of faith, the feeling of the love of God and, and, and uh, you know, God's love for you and your love for God. Pietism did stress the importance of reading and knowing scriptures. Um, again, it's personal devotions and so forth were very important and, and the importance of knowing the scriptures was very high. Pietism tended to downplay ritual, right? They, they were against not only thinking that faith was just about Uh, having the right teachings in your head. They also tended to emphasize that faith was not just about having an ancient uh, form of worship or doing rituals the right way or something like that. So they tended to downplay um, ritual, sometimes downright distrusted ritual. Music was very important for pietism. Pietists have written some of the most beloved of all Christian hymns, and they continue to. And pietism stresses living upright lives and stresses good personal habits regarding sex, drinking, cleanliness, hard work, and so forth. So um, discipleship was often a largely a matter of kind of uh, being personally upright. And pietism tended to discourage Christians from getting too involved in worldly affairs such as politics. Of course, in, uh, um, in the 1600s, most of the Lutheran churches were state churches, which means that the, the uh, prince, the local prince, the local governor was also um, the head of the church. So, um, or had ultimate authority over that. There were bishops of sorts, um, uh, but the, uh, the government authority had ultimate authority over the church. So uh, the pietists um, really activated very important missionary movements and 
the Lutheran Church in North America is was largely founded or established by a man named Hen Henry Melchior Muhlenberg, whose training was in pietistic institutions, university, seminary. And in Indonesia, um, Ludwig Ingver Namensen, um, missionary to Indonesia, was uh, raised and um, educated in, pi in pietistic institutions. So they did fantastic work in getting the word of God out and they continue to. Just, uh, just again, a Kaiser of Wil Wilhelm, uh, he was um, the king of Prussia, the Kaiser of Prussia. Kaiser just means it's the same word as in Latin, Caesar, but he was the king in Prussia and he, um, he established a single form of worship across his kingdom. And that form of worship was very pietistic in style. So um, throughout Prussia in the mid to late 1800s, about the time that uh, Namensen came to Indonesia and Namensen was from uh, Northern Germany, very, uh, a land very, uh, uh, the, the, the form of worship that Kaiser Wilhelm sort of instituted, said all churches will use this form of worship. Well, that was one that Ingvar uh, Namensen would have been very familiar with. So Muhlenberg and Namensen introduced pietistic worship styles to the places that they serve. I think it's interesting. This is in Germany, you could say it's a very, international crew. We have uh, folks of African descent here and looks like some folks of European descent here. But you see the familiar black robe and the uh, linen, uh, the, the linen tabs, the 11s. So there we have it, the, the similar sort of uh, look. Now, in North America, when I was growing up, pastors wore white robes like that. Um, but the worship style, as I said, very, very similar to what um, we had in uh, what, what I saw when I've uh, you know watched worship online in uh, Indonesia, and that style is is pretty much an inheritance of the Pietists. So now um, for this part, it, uh, I just kind of want to um, move on and and uh, note remind, reminding us kind of what I'm doing here. Basically, um, my call is to kind of uh, help us understand our Lutheran heritage and then to kind of share the experience that we've had in North America and just kind of leave it uh, with you and, and say, well, let's talk about, about uh, what that might mean and, and whether that might be helpful for you in Indonesia and in, uh, in the various churches um, as we think about whether or not um, some changes would convey Christ better for us here. So anyway, again, you know, uh, my church expects to benefit by learning much uh, about worship through conversation like this with our partners in the gospel in Indonesian churches. So thank you very much for being in partnership with our Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Thank you very much for being in partnership with churches across the world in the Lutheran World Federation. And we hope that sharing our experience of worship uh, or rather of worship reform will help the 13 churches in the KN LWF consider how you will continue to proclaim and live out the gospel of Christ. Um, far more important than the ELCA's experience is the big picture summary that we just reviewed. So um, when I was growing up several decades ago, worship pretty much across the evangelical, uh, across Lutheran churches in North America was much more pietistic in style than it is now. Um, so here are some, I think, pretty uh, uh, qualities that I think pretty much go along with being uh, pietistic in style. Worship is almost solely focused on the sermon. So worship, really, the uh, people thought about uh, everything before uh, uh, the sermon as just something to warm you up so that you could hear the sermon. And then uh, after the sermon, there would just be a few prayers and maybe announcements and a hymn, and that was it. But the sermon was, was very much in the center and took up the longest amount of time in the worship service, took up most of the time of the service. Sermons tended to be geared toward teaching beliefs and establishing personal habits. Um, 
Now, faith was more often regarded as an interior personal matter, uh, as an intensely personal matter. So um, we tended to be uncomfortable showing our faith emotionally, showing any emotion in worship. And we were uncomfortable sharing our faith in words. Well, again, faith is an interior thing and we you know, cherish our faith, but it was hard for us to talk about our faith. Now, this is, this is something that was a kind of a falling away from a kind of pietistic ideal because, you know, the, as I said, the pietists have done excellent work in establishing uh, societies to share the word across the world. But, um, but after a couple generations, you know, uh, the kind of interior focus seemed to develop into a difficulty with uh, letting this very deep and powerful faith within us, you know, back out to share it. So in the church, when I was growing up, we were rather uncomfortable with very much ritual. We kind of thought it was not... Uh, kind of beside the point that it didn't really uh, further uh, what we were doing in worship. Um, now, in my in my churches, we worked very hard uh, to preserve our specifically Northern European heritage. I grew up in churches that were Danish and Swedish in heritage, and folks who grew up in German heritage churches would say the same thing. And uh, sometimes being a good Christian was confused with being patriotic, or being a good citizen who never caused trouble. Remember, um, the kind of ancestral draw state churches. I was very fascinated to see, by the way, that in um, in the uh, um, Batak Confession, they, they very pointedly say that the church shouldn't be a state church. And i, I you know, the church that I grew up in was not a state church, um, but uh, the kind of ancestor church the father church or the mother church from which um, our churches came were state churches. And yeah, there were real problems with that. So, um, I, and I think a holdover from that experience was that sometimes uh, Lutherans didn't tend to be very prophetic, right? So if we thought, if we, we thought that being a good Christian was primarily a matter of going along with what the government was doing, uh, which often is, really important but if we felt like the government was doing something wrong or something contrary to the gospel it we tended to think well it's not our place to criticize the government so well then beginning in the 60s there's an ecumenical movement uh, that encouraged lutherans both to recognize our unity with other Christians. So the ecumenical movement where we sort of recognize that whether you're Lutheran or Reformed or Episcopalian or Baptist, we all worship one God. And so we have much in common. But as we did that, that caused us to also say, well, then what if, if we're all one in Christ? Well, what what makes us distinctively Lutheran? What is what what gifts do Lutherans bring to the whole church of Jesus Christ? This spurred a movement to rediscover Lutheran's writings and confessions. And we were surprised by much of what we found as, as a church in North America. Um, I, 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 I have a slide misplaced here, but I meant to go back at this point and note that you know, one of the things that we found was that um, Luther really thought that it was good and important to have Holy Communion every week. Or the first, the first Lutherans, you know, it's in the Augsburg Confession anyway, that yeah, we, we, we uh, not only do we have communion four times a year, as was the old medieval tradition, but, but we think it's important to have it every week. Uh, I believe uh, Luther went back to the, excuse me, to the second chapter of Acts, where it says that uh, the disciples had everything in common, and they met week by week, breaking bread and, uh, and, and sharing everything with glad and generous hearts. So that breaking the bread has been uh, interpreted, I believe Luther interpreted it as um, sharing Holy Communion every week. But anyway, um, uh, we, uh, we uh, kind of rededicated ourselves to uh, these kind of core commitments that in worship, the main thing is to receive Christ and the Holy Spirit. And receiving uh, 
Christ through the word and through the Holy Supper, we receive the means for us to believe and live faithfully. And of course, as we made changes, we asked that question, what, what old ways will best share Christ? What changes will best share Christ? And as I'll say in a minute, um, that wound up, we, we wound up with all sorts of different styles of worship um, as, as we uh, um, went through this uh, ecumenical change. And many of us kept older forms. So um, until around 1960, again, going back, the worship services in Lutheran churches often followed a three-part pattern, sermon in the center. So basically we just gathered together, sang a few songs, maybe a psalm and maybe a canticle. Then there's a scripture reading or two and a pretty long sermon. Oh, and when I was growing up, worship had to be one hour long. If it was like an hour and five minutes, uh, people got angry because they had Sunday dinner in the oven and it would get burned. But if it, but if it didn't last an hour, they felt like the pastor wasn't you know, uh, uh, doing his job. So it had to be exactly an hour. Um, but um, after the, after the, the uh, sermon, sermon would be you know, 40 minutes long when I was growing up. But then after, uh, after that, just very simple, you know, a hymn, maybe we'd say the creed and say our prayers. We definitely would say the prayers and then off we'd go. Um, since this um, liturgical renewal movement though, we've added an element. So we still do our gathering, we receive the word. And then in most Lutheran churches now in North America, in, especially in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, um, I would say probably, probably in 1960, I bet there were, I bet there was less than 10 or 15% that received Holy Communion every week. And now I bet that it's less than 20% that do not receive Holy Communion every week. So this has been kind of the main change is that we receive Eucharist very, very frequently. And then after that, the sending. So, you know, just to run through exactly how, how that's gone. Now in, in making, in kind of uh, implementing these changes, kind of growing into these changes, we've understood ourselves to be kind of growing into a very ancient form of worship that, that goes back to the very earliest centuries of the church. Um, so we gather, um, you know, uh, sometimes we'll have greetings and songs and a word about the occasion, you know, what, what, what's going on this Sunday, what do the lessons say this Sunday in a in formal way. And that's basically changed since I was, a, or it hasn't changed much since I was a kid. The service of the word then, you know, the, the gospel of Christ is always read and proclaimed. And in North American churches on Sunday morning, the sermon is almost on the gospel reading. Um, you can find places where it's not, but I would say oh, most of the time, most pastors, most of the time preach on the gospels and there'll be an epistle read and an Old Testament reading read, but uh the gospel is, is central and usually the gospel is, uh, is the basis of the sermon. And in any case, it's very important in our preaching uh, that we always make sure that we proclaim the gospel. So even if we're preaching on an Old Testament lesson, we proclaim the love of God in Christ Jesus and you know, God's love uh, for, for God's people always, no matter what, and that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And that the love of Christ is shown once and for all in Christ's death and resurrection for us. But along with that, um, the law of God is taught. People are warned of the consequences of not loving God and their neighbors. And people are urged to live fully and joyfully in God's kingdom now. Loving God back not only in worship, but primarily, most of all, loving God back by loving their neighbors and then, you know, prayers, the creed, and sharing of the peace are part of this part of the service. Almost every Sunday when we get together in almost all of our churches now, we have Holy Communion. Um, we believe that the gospel is proclaimed through the act of sharing the body and blood of Christ in Holy Communion. And it's offered and received as a gift of love and forgiveness with thanksgiving. 
And uh, we, we see this as, again, a means of receiving the grace of God. Uh, probably the biggest uh, difficulty in our churches and receiving Holy Communion every week it, uh, has been members expressing, well, but I'm not worthy to receive Holy Communion every week or so often. Aku and, tidak layak untuk menerima perjamuan kudus setiap minggu. Ya, tentu saja. Tidak ada orang yang layak untuk menerima perjamuan kudus. Dan untuk itulah kamu dilayakkan. Untuk itulah kamu harus menerima perjamuan kudus. Of God in Christ. Uh, every every uh, time we gather for worship. And then So a, a note about Um, so we, I think we could wait for a minute because maybe something wrong with the uh, Professor Charles' connection. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry about that. My my computer, uh, my my internet went off. So. Okay, Professor. Are we back on? Yes, please. Okay, let's. Uh, I'll get back to our. Oh, uh, uh, Daddy, it says that my uh, screen sharing is disabled. Now you can, Professor. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, everybody, for your patience. So, we're uh, we're not too far. We're not too far from the end here. Oops, let me get all the way up forward where we. So I'm uh, talking about the kind of the effect of having weekly, uh, weekly communion in our congregations. And uh, we'll get right there, getting closer. Here we go. I just wanted to say that uh, while most of our churches have gone to receiving Holy Communion every week, and we've uh, and that's kind of in, in accord with what the confessions say, um, it hasn't changed worship styles, or rather, um, the, there's been a kind of a flourishing of different styles of worship. So for some, more frequent communion has gone along with kind of reclaiming some of the other kind of uh, very traditional, you know, going back uh, to uh, the very, very early church in the Middle Ages. So uh, we saw the picture of the earlier, early on in the presentation, I showed you the churches in Africa, the church in Africa where the pastors wear all the robes. And I showed you Luther's, uh, what worship was like in Luther's Wittenberg with very, kind of the candles and crucifixes and, and um, all of those things. Well, that's some of our churches have kind of reclaimed some of those um, outward um, things. We sometimes call them adiaphora, which means they're indifferent things. Part of our Lutheran tradition is to say, well, look, if you if you find it helpful, if it conveys Christ, 
to, for, to use the robes and the rituals and, and uh, um, all of those things, great, you know, do that. Um, if you find that it doesn't convey Christ, don't. So uh, for some, more frequent weekly communion has gone along with those more traditional practices. We've had a greater um, understanding of and appreciation for the church season. So, you know, Lent and Advent and uh, it, our, our lessons are all based on the church seasons uh, through the three-year lectionary and other things. But in other ELCA churches, um, they've gone very much a different way. So I showed you the picture of worship in, in uh, Malaysia, where almost every church that I visited, you know, that the music is provided by the teenagers, high schoolers, young people who play electric guitar, they'll have drums, an electric keyboard, and, uh, and electric bass, and it's more contemporary music. And uh, Many churches have found that that's gone along. Uh, so the uh, contemporary music and worship and the rejection of traditional pyramids. In many of those churches, uh, the pastor doesn't wear any different clothes than any of the other worshipers. So, and in some of those churches, you know, uh, preaching is focused on specific topics that the pastor will choose week by week, you know, just kind of choose the verses and the sermon that he thinks needs to be had. So I'll just point out in, in North America and in the United States, if you almost since the 1960s, almost everybody receives weekly communion now. But if you live over here in the Eastern part of the United States, um, your worship is probably very kind of in the kind of an ancient tradition, right? With uh, with the robes and the high church, lots of ritual. If you live here, which is the other place where lots and lots of Lutherans live, it's much less frequent that you'll have that high church worship and much more frequent that you'll have more contemporary music and, and things like that. And people in other parts of the country, it's just kind of a mixed bag. I just wanted to point out much the same, well, something like that is true in Europe as well. In Sweden and in Norway, they have very lots of ritual in worship. In uh, Northern Germany and Denmark, um, not so much. So anyway, this is just kind of a, in summary, what, what effect is having weekly communion had on us. Well, it hasn't really changed our worship styles, our music styles. We kind of continue to go different directions there. But receiving Christ in the sacrament, um, as well as through th sermons, has begun to change the way Christians in the ELCA understand and feel about God, about faith, and about ourselves. I think it's true that we are beginning to be less heady only in faith when I was growing up. Um, like I said, sermons and worship tended to focus on teaching us doctrines, teaching us, you know, teaching teachings. Um, it, it was focused on teachings and anymore, it's more focused on um, helping us to understand our faith as a way of life, as something that affects everything that we do, not just the way that we think. I believe it's true that we are beginning to feel the love of God and Christ more deeply. Um, we're, I think, in many ways, a more gospel-centered church. We are beginning to think about what it is to be a human being in a different way. Um, growing up, I, I felt like I was taught that um, a human being is like a soul, an immaterial soul trapped in a body. And somehow receiving Holy Communion every week, we receive the body and blood of Christ. Christ comes into the bread and wine. Christ is present in the bread and wine. And you know, God comes in a bodily way to us, a material way. And I think that's reflected that we're beginning to regard ourselves more as creatures of earth, given life by the breath of God. I think that's a really significant change. And again, these are just my observations or opinions. Um, again, I think we're beginning to regard our faith as a way of life rather than as just a setting set of teachings that we hold in our minds. Um, and here's a, here's a really big change. I think we're beginning to hear the call to serve our neighbor with all of our powers. Um, 
That is, uh, being a Christian isn't just a matter of being good to and supporting other people in our community of faith, but we're beginning to see that we're called to use all of our powers, including our wealth, whatever money we have, our power as citizens, um, to, uh, to try to shape uh, our, our, our nation and, and laws and policies uh, so that they will uplift our neighbors, especially those who need to be lifted up most of all. So that's pretty much the end of my own presentation here. And, and um, I just, again, offer that last part as uh, observations about what's happened in the church I belong to in the last generation or two. And so here's kind of, I hope that maybe just helps begin a conversation for uh, churches in Indonesia. So, um, so some questions we might consider, you know, what do you appreciate most? Or maybe what do you appreciate least about worship in your city? Do you feel like there are things that um, you might change that um, would help you to your worship to um, proclaim Christ better, right? Uh, or will it serve your church better for worship to stay just as it is? Um, that's really a, a, something for all of our churches always to be asking about. If you do think uh, some changes are in order, what changes do you think would serve the mission of your church? Or what concerns or fears do you have about worship? So um, that is what I have prepared. So um, uh, thank you very much for giving me the time to share that with you. And, and I'm really eager. Uh, I, I am very anxious and, and uh, desirous of hearing um, about the situation in Indonesia and about the church life and worship in Indonesia. And I'm glad to field any questions. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, such a great uh, presentation, a lot of information and new uh, for us uh, uh, and for myself, actually. And then uh, uh, we would like to invite all the participants, if you have any questions or comments or uh, concern that we would like uh, to hear as well uh, from your experience in your church, uh, we would like and happy to hear about your uh, comments as well regarding to these topics. And of course, Professor, we already have uh, one uh, question or two questions. Uh, first is uh, from uh, Bapak Tuhoni Telambaunua. He is a uh, Dieforus of uh, Nias Church, BNKP. So he asks that, uh, thank you, Professor Charles Peterson, for the lecturing. The basis of worship is the act of God and not human evil. This is different right. from the primal religion which, is, uh, which prioritizes human efforts to please God. And this has been embedded in human life and it's still alive today. Priestly, with solar gracia, it makes people less active. So is there really no dialectics in Lutheran worship? That's the first question. And the second one from uh, Roberto Hamunangan. So thank you for the lecture, Reverend Charles Peterson. I'd like to ask your opinions about the youth nowadays that prefer more contemporary ways than our Lutheran ways on, of worship. Should we stay in our ways of worship or should we change some of our ways? Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I'll, why don't I go ahead and uh, maybe address the second question um, first. <clears throat> I want to think about the first question uh, while, while, while uh, answering the second. That was a very, both excellent questions. Thank you. Yeah, so um, in North America, we've had, you know, we've called them worship wars <laughs> over the last uh, generation. Yeah, yeah. About um, the style of music in worship and what will attract youth and so forth. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the short answer to the question, um, sh should we stay in our ways of worship or should we change some of our ways? The, the answer, of course, is, well, what will best convey Christ, right? So um, 
but I, that that's a little bit too easy to say. Um, let's let's dig into it a little bit. In in the churches that I've served, you know, we've we've struggled with this question, and I've been a pastor for thirty years, and we always struggle with this question. We we have you know, should we have more contemporary music? Should we not? You we have we have a big church organ. I mean, the the church organ that I have it takes up one whole one whole. Uh, uh, the, the, the back wall of the church is covered with pipes from this huge pipe organ. But people say, well, nobody, the young folks don't like organ music. It is a really expensive organ and it's beautiful, but nobody likes that music. So should we just have guitar music in worship? And I just, I think, um, you know, the, the question it's, it's always, um, as in so many areas of life, you know, what is the right thing to do? What is Christ calling us to do? Um, it takes wisdom and, and discernment to know just what will best serve Christ. What will, you know, but I think it's worthwhile noting that um, there's always a cost to changing things. Um, and there's a, there's a cost to not changing things. Um, you know, Paul, uh, Paul famously uh, said that he had become all things to all people so that he might by all means save some. Um, but it's, it's difficult for our churches to, to follow that advice. Um, or, yeah, probably what, 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 I'll just share what I've, what I've uh, found in, in uh, the place that I serve in Columbus, Ohio, um, there aren't very many churches that have lots of high liturgy, lots of ritual. And we found that in our community, that there were people who, who just found that the ritual um, communicated the gospel to them, communicated the word of God and the power of the love of God in, in a way that more simple worship or contemporary uh, worship did not. And so in the last congregation that I served, um, we tended to say, well, here's a group of, of people who, uh, who feel that they'll hear the gospel better with higher ritual, with more ritual. So that's the, that's the strategy that we took. But in doing that, we know that there were lots of people who um, just um, weren't attracted to it. So... Um, you know, in our case, that time we just we just made the decision. Um, Luther uh, famously is said to have said, "There, there are those times when, uh, when you feel like if you go to the right, you might make a mistake, but if you go to the left, you might make a mistake. So what do you do?" And Luther's answer was, "Well, you, uh, or you go to the right, you might sin. You go to the left, you might sin. What do we do?" And the answer was, "Well." Um, sin boldly. <laughs> uh, you have to do something. So whatever you do, do your best to do it well. Uh, uh, to do it, and of course, do it because you think it's faithful, and and strive to uh, strive to do it well. So sin boldly, Luther said, trusting all the more boldly in the grace of Christ. So um, I guess, um, yeah, I guess I just say that there are a number of things to think about. You know. Um, if the if the church is losing young people uh, because uh, we're not we're worshiping in a kind of traditional way, that's that's one thing. If uh, but um, it's another thing if it's if if we think one of the dangers that that sometimes comes in worship is that we start to think that worship is just about entertaining ourselves, and um, that's a very different thing than uh, conveying Christ. So again, I, I guess I'd just say um, it's a very difficult decision to make. What we can say is as Lutherans, we are free to alter the way that we worship. We're, as, we're free before God to change the way we worship. Um, as long as our worship is a means of conveying the grace of Christ, we're free to decide whether more ritual or less ritual, more tradition or less tradition is uh, a characteristic of our worship. You know, again, the, the church that I serve in this in the United States, very high liturgy. Um, and I and I love it. When I was in Malaysia, um, 
all the churches were, you know, very, very uh, much lower liturgy on, on the whole. And worship was, you know, a contemporary music and everything. And both were very faithful to to Jesus Christ, I think. So just maybe trying to give a sense of how to go about making the decision um, as uh, church to church. So I, I hope that at least um, began to uh, stir up some ideas for you. So that was the second, that was the second question. Now, uh, Daddy could, uh, Reverend Daddy, could you repeat that first question? Yes. And the first question, uh, it's about, uh, okay. The basis of worship is the act of God and not human effort. This is different from the primal religion which uh, prioritize human efforts to please God. And this has been embedded in human life and is still alive today. Priestly, with sola gracia, it makes people less active. So is there really no dialectics in Lutheran worship? Yeah. So, that yeah, that's that question about about um, motivating or moving people to serve. So if we're if we're if we're uh, put right with um, with God by grace alone, through faith alone, well, <clears throat> once God's love, we come to worship and we receive the love of God, right? Why why bother to uh, live any different from the rest of the world then? So. In, in the last uh, uh, presentation that I made, I think the answer to that comes in uh, the, well, my favorite sort of approach to answering that question is, is in that parable of the prodigal son. You know, the, the prodigal son was in his father's household and he was very deeply loved by his father, we, we take it. And at one point he said, father, treat me, I'll treat you like you're dead. Give me your inheritance, give me my inheritance. And I'll go off. And he did that. And the father said, okay, go ahead. He gave him the money. And the son lived it up for a short time. But then um, the money ran out. He was separated from his father. And being separated from his father, he was in misery. And he was in misery until he came home. And, and coming home, the son said, oh, I'll somehow or other earn my way back or uh, through my repentance or my, my sorrow. I'll, I'll win my father over so that he'll let me at least be a servant in his household. But before the prodigal son could even um, walk up the, the, the road, walk up the driveway to get into the father's house, father rushed out and embraced him, right? So, so God's always ready to embrace us. So why, why, um, why live in God's way? Why, why? Why live our lives close to God? Why not just go to church and then um, do whatever we want to during the week? And the answer is it's like the prodigal son separating himself from the father. And, and I think we need to find ways of communicating and showing and demonstrating that, that a life of discipleship, a life following Christ, a life living by grace through faith is far better than any other option any other kind of living. And um, I think for Luther, this was very much the case. Um, that that um, he, he found that uh, uh, living in Christ really freed him from freedom, in some way frees us from ourselves, right? Because we're never satisfied. Our, our own souls, our own, you know, if we, if we just seek to please ourselves, you know, we'll, we'll never be satisfied that, uh, that, um, as St. Augustine said in, in his confession, you know, our, our, souls, uh, our souls are restless, O Lord, until they rest in you. And I think that's really, um, that's really the sort of approach that we need to take in order to answer that question about um, why should we be disciples? Why pick up that cross? Why, why um, go to why um, you know, suffer even for for the sake of Christ? And the answer, I think, needs to be, or at least part of the answer needs to be, it's it's a fuller and richer life than any other. It's a more blessed life than any other for all of its difficulty. So I, I hope 
again, I hope that helps a little better. I hope that is satisfying, but I'm glad for a follow-up question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor. I think uh, uh, we, the time is uh, really almost uh, done. So uh, could you please uh, give uh, some conclusion for our uh, last, uh, uh, I mean, last part of this topic about uh, worship and music? Oh, sure. So um, I gave a little bit of history from, from uh, as I understand it, of, of kind of Lutheran worship, a little bit of a background about how, uh, what, what goes into our decisions about whether to stay the same or whether to make changes. I'll, I will point out that um, the history of our tradition, right? So our, our Christian tradition right, has a history and that history is a, is a history of always reforming. Um, reforming you know, the language that we use and the way that we worship. And it's always also a tradition of going back to the source. So we're at the same time changing and going back. And I'm really eager and delighted and honored to uh, be part um, of the in the in the media, media, um, discussing, you know, how shall we serve Christ in our time and place, you know, seeking the will of God, seeking out the Spirit's guidance, and then, you know, asking God for the grace and the power and the strength to uh, follow behind the wisdom to, um, to discern what God's will is for us. As we as we move ahead, um, we don't really always know what the right thing to do is, or what the most uh, effective thing to do will be. But we do know that if we if we gather together as church, if we uphold one another in prayer, and if we seek the love and guidance of God, we will have it, and God will be with us. And so it's in that spirit that I offer the conversation today and I am very much looking forward and um, uh, and I feel very honored to be part of that conversation and the work of Christ in Indonesia coming soon <clears throat> so well uh, this is our uh, final webinar or uh, and thank you so much uh, for all the participants and thank you for uh, Bapak Rumanja as the chief of KNLWF and colleague from uh, Sabah uh, LSE. Yeah, and, and to all participants and also the Vina uh, from LSE as well. And thank you so much, Joseph Zong as well. And uh, we, we will uh, have um, another webinar again from LSE Indonesia. And we would like to join as well with uh, LSE Mal uh, Malaysia and Sabah. Uh, they uh, offer a lot of webinar and then we share information uh, between two of uh, LSA and we, we are happy to share uh, about the Luther theology and, and knowledge. And thank you so uh, very much to Professor Charles who gave the time and, and, and knowledge as well for us about Luther theology and Haposan as an interpreter for our webinar today. Thank you so much. We appreciate uh, thank you, Hapa -san. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Professor Charles, could you please uh, to to say pray or grace uh, before we leave oh, this webinar? I'd be delighted to. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, I always like to share this uh, in the United States so uh, and other places. We begin prayer. The person praying says, "The Lord be with you." And everybody answers, and also with you. We kind of get together and pray that way. So, the Lord be with you. And also, also, with, you. also with you. Let us pray. Dear gracious God, Almighty Father, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of worship. We give you thanks that when two or three gather in your name, you are present in our midst. We give you thanks that through your word and through the holy sacraments, we receive your grace. And through the word and holy sacraments, we receive your Holy Spirit. And by the Holy Spirit, we have the power to believe and trust in you. And that through faith in you, our lives are fuller and richer um, than, than we can imagine. And that through the Holy Spirit and through faith, we have, we have hope, a sure and certain hope for eternal life in your glory.
Lord, we bless and praise you for the time that we've had together today. We pray, Lord, that it will bear fruit in our own lives and in the lives of the churches, the congregations that we serve. Lord, um, we don't really know from one day to the next where we will be or what we will be doing. But Lord, we pray that you will help us to trust and to believe that no matter where we are and no matter what we are doing, as we trust in you, you will be with us. Your, your hand will uphold us and your love will lead us. All these things we pray in thanksgiving through our Lord Jesus Christ, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory throughout all ages of ages. Amen. So thank you all and see you for the next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So long, everyone.